Today is April 16, 2004. I'm interviewing Vietnam veteran Michael Parker at his home in West Hartford, Connecticut. Interviewer is Eileen Hurst Downey from Central Connecticut State University. Mike, would you state your full name, your birth date, and your current address? Michael A. Parker, Sr. What branch of the service were you in, Mike, and what war were you in? Uh, United States Marine Corps, and I served in Vietnam. What was your rank when you were discharged? Lance Corporal. Mike, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Where were you living at the time? West Hartford, Connecticut, with my folks. Why did you join? Uh, I was getting out of high school. I wasn't ready for college. And um, my father and my uncles were all in the service. I thought it was the thing to do. Do you remember the date? July 22nd, 1968. Why did you pick the Marine Corps? Uh, they were always known as the best. And um, if you were going to be going to war, you didn't want to be going with people that did not want to be in the service. And if you're going to be with some drafted draftees who did not want to be in the service, I thought it would be uh, detrimental to my health. <laughs> Do you recall your first days in service? Oh, yes. First day in boot camp, yes. What was that like? Uh, getting yelled at, getting pushed around, uh, not getting any sleep. Uh, they kept us off balance for a couple of days. Where did you go for boot camp? Paris Island, South Carolina. So you left West Hartford, Connecticut, went right to Paris Island? Uh, yes. Took a train down. How long was the boot camp? We were in boot camp July and I uh, was out of boot camp in December, third week of December. I had a stress fracture in one of my legs. Yeah, Took me a little longer. While you were in boot camp? Yes. Did you get the fracture from boot camp? Yes. Do you know how that happened? No, not really. Too much marching or running or whatever. But it was okay. Just held me back for about three weeks. What kinds of things did they train you for at boot camp? Boot camp is just uh, to get you into military frame of mind. Do what you're told to do and don't hesitate. Taught you a little bit about uh, um, using weapons. The M16 or M14 at that time. Do you remember any of your instructors? Uh, Staff Sergeant Goosby, Staff Sergeant Forsythe, and there was one more I can't remember. Goodwin, I think it was. Sergeant Goodwin, maybe. Do you remember what they were like? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, they, oh, yeah, they were Can tough. They were tough. Um, very tough individuals. Um, they had a job to do and they did it quite well. How did you get through boot camp? Day by day. Took it one day at a time. You're up early. And if you and after you got through your uh, daily uh, physical training, your morning physical training, you went to breakfast. And then you geared everything between breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It was a day by day operation down there. Do you think that it was tough physical training? Oh yeah, yeah, it's very tough physical training. Um, I went down there, I weighed 230 pounds. When I left boot camp, I weighed 170 pounds. Holy cow. <laughs> they don't like fat people down there, I guess. Uh, earlier, Mike, you told me that you had actually signed up while you were in high school before you enlisted. Um, can you tell me how that worked? Uh, yes, we, um, there was a group of us that decided we were going to go into service. We were 17 years old and um, our parents had to sign for us. And eventually only uh, myself and my buddy Bob uh, Lehman went down together. And the other guys didn't go down to almost six months after us because their parents wouldn't sign for them. So you were actually still in high school and your parents did sign for you? Yes. And then 
you didn't actually leave until you graduated high school? Correct. Graduated in June and left in July. And it was you and one of your other buddies who actually went? Yes. Did you stay together with him? We stayed for a few weeks together and then he got set back for I forgot what reason. And um, I didn't see him again until uh, we were both out of service. Which war did you serve in? Vietnam. After basic training, did you go right over to Vietnam? No, I went to North Carolina for advanced infantry training. Came home from leave for a few weeks over uh, Christmas and New Year's. And then we were sent out to uh, California for um, uh, mountain climbing, staging. Where in California did you go? El Toro. We're at the uh, we're at um, Camp Pendleton. Excuse me. We're at Camp Pendleton for our training. Did your mountain climbing help you ever? Oh yeah, I never knew Vietnam had mountains. <laughs> but you'd pack up every day and um, do some more infantry training with the uh, weapons. But there was a lot of uh, just uh, humping up and down mountains. Where did you go from Camp Pendleton? Okinawa. Did you know at that point that you were going to Vietnam? We knew when we were in Camp Pendleton we'd be heading for Nam. Oh, you did. So the mountain training was actually for the Vietnam. Yes, that was a stage, and that was our stage and area to go to Okinawa and then to Vietnam. Do you remember when you got your orders for Vietnam? Yes. Where were you? I was. Uh, we were in North Carolina when we uh, were told uh, we'll be staging in California before we came home for our first leave. Oh, that was before you had They told us that. Officially, they told us uh, in Okinawa. I mean, things could change, but officially it was done in Okinawa. Did you stay in Okinawa or was it just a stopover? Well, I think we spent maybe a week there. It wasn't much time. And from Okinawa, where did you go? Um, I Corps, Vietnam. Flew into Da Nang Air Base. You remember when you landed in Vietnam? Yes. What were your first impressions? It was warm, dry, uh, instant sweat, and very a lot of people moving around. It almost looked chaotic. Do you know the date, month, and year anyway? In Vietnam? Yeah, when you first. February '68. I'm sorry, February '69. I landed in Vietnam. What was your job assignment? My first job assignment was uh, I was a baker. They asked who could cook and I raised my hand. I figured I would be a good duty. So I was assigned to a uh, night, uh, night cook, I guess it would be called, with a half dozen other guys. I could did you, that for a few weeks. Could you cook? Oh yes. Yes. I still can cook. Where was your base? It was uh, headquarters company, headquarters battalion, I Corps. Right at Da Nang, so right where you right landed? Right north of Da Nang. We landed in, in, yeah, it was just north of Da Nang is where my uh, base was. After your first couple of weeks as Baker, what was your next job? Uh, I was in the uh, battalion mail room. I served in there for my rest of my time. What were your duties there? In the mail room was yeah. just to uh, get the mail out to all the guys. It was the most important job in the service is the mail room people. I can imagine. You, mail is very important. How regular was the mail service? It was good. It was a seven day a week operation. Did but you when we mail were in every day? Yes. Did you every send day. Mail out? Generally every day. It depends on the activity around us. If we were called out to go on a patrol or do a line duty or go with recon or whatever because we were still grunts and we still had to go out with the different units that went out. So um, it's generally a, an everyday operation, but if there was activity that would slow mail down, no one was there to do the mail. I bet you were one of the favorite people on camp. On camp. We were very popular until people got Dear John letters or some bad news from home. One individual actually shot up our hooch when he got a bad letter from home. Really? Yeah, we were all out on patrol and 
he got into the hooch with his uh, M16 and shot the place up, thinking that it was, you know, he was blaming us for his bad letter. Killing the messenger. Yeah, they took care of him. Did you see combat? Yes. Can you recall any incidents? Uh, the first few weeks we were there, uh, we got hit up on um, the Alpha line, uh, the band line. Uh, they actually took our flag down, the American flag, from the um, uh, communication tower, raised up their Vietnam flag, the North Vietnam flag. Very scary moment for new recruits in Vietnam. Um, if it wasn't for Puff and some Cobras coming in, because we basically lost the hill and we had to take it back before morning. So it was, um, wasn't a good night. It was an all night thing. Um, they hit us pretty good. What's Alpha Line? Uh, every line around the, the um, we had Alpha and Beta, or Band Line we used to call it. Um, it was brought by Dialogue Pass. We had our own area we had to cover. Every, it was a mountain. It was a mountain range. And uh, it was more security for our headquarters. And we ran our own security. So when you would go out on these patrols where you would actually be in combat and, and you weren't in the mail room, what was your job? I was, uh, <laughs> I was an 0331, a machine gunner with the 60. I had a 16 sometimes. Uh, sometimes we had a, a 79. It depends who was available to handle the different weapons. So when, in this particular instance, when you'd only been there a few weeks, were you responsible for the machine gun? Yes. And I was an A-gunner. What's an A-gunner? Uh, assisting the, uh, the uh, gunner itself. You, know, you work together to keep the gun working. Were there many casualties in your unit? In the unit? Overall, no. Tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences. The good ones? Both. <laughs> Uh, there was, uh, well, the first few weeks in Nam when we got hit, it was, um, you know, an eye-opener that uh, we actually do uh, do strategic withdrawals to get us to get the hill back. Um, we got hit again. Uh, we're just going out on patrol. We're going through a riverbed, and I don't think we got 200 yards outside our line. We got ambushed, and they knew exactly where we were going. They knew exactly where our ins and out trails were. Um, and another time when we took some, uh, we took, uh, they hit us when we um, were changing the military postscript money, the MPS, I guess it was called. We weren't allowed to have greenbacks, so we had military money. And every six months, I believe, they would change it. It was called monopoly money. And that would infuriate all the, um, the uh, people that were in the um, black market because now their money was no good. And so they would take it out on whoever was around, and we got hit that night. And uh, when we dragged some of the um, enemy bodies back in, three of the people that were that attacked us worked inside our compound. So those are the so some those, of the memories you remember. They were actually enemy spies that were working in your compound. Oh uh, yes. And no one was aware of it until you found their bodies. No one knew that. Yeah, killed. I believe they were the laundry guys, and one was a barber. Is the reason for using the monopoly money because of the black market? Yes, uh, the greenbacks, they don't want that to filter out anywhere throughout, up back up to uh, North Vietnam at the time. I believe if you got caught with greenbacks, you could get um, brought up on charges. So your whole time in Vietnam, you used the monopoly money? Yes. Were you awarded any medals or citations? No, just a combat action ribbon, and then we got some, I don't know, cross of gallantry and some other stuff. Your unit got the cross of gallantry? I think I so, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. For our, uh, for our successful actions in the i Corps area. Overall, or any specific incidents? No, I think it was just overall. We had, uh, we controlled the area at that time. Did you stay in i your whole time in Vietnam? Yes. Were you at the same headquarters base the entire time? Yes. Almost, yes. 
While you were in Vietnam, did you get to see any other parts of the country? Uh, well, Red Beach and China Beach was in country R&R. &R. Uh, down into Da Nang, right into the Da Nang Harbor there. I was allowed to go there one night, and uh, that was about it. Other than that, we uh, stayed out at... We weren't allowed to uh, move off base too freely over there, as yeah. you can imagine. Uh, there was a place called Four Corners, which was a, a little village um, that you could drop off and pick up at Four Corners, but you weren't allowed to go into the village. We were not allowed to go into any of the villages. How much in-country R&R &R did you get in your year in Vietnam? One weekend. One weekend? Yes. That was it, the entire year? Yeah, it was three days. Did you get any other R&R? &R? Yes, I went to uh, Taiwan for a week. I think we had a week. Do you remember what that was like? Oh yeah, that was wonderful. <laughs> Being clean, wearing nice clothes, having a good old time. How did it feel to have to go back to Vietnam after being on R&R &R in Taiwan? Some guys uh, didn't go back, unfortunately. Um, they went AWOL when they went on R&R. &R. Very, well, very few in our group, but they did go AWOL. But the funny part was uh, in Taiwan, we actually had a manicure done to our fingers, and they cleaned us up good. And here we are back in the jungle, and in the swamp, and our, we had fancy glowing fingernails with <laughs> clear polish on them. We looked really good. Yeah, we took a little heat for that. There was a few of us that did that, but hey, we look good. <laughs> How did you stay in touch with your family when you were over in Vietnam? I wrote. Um, I was allowed to call through Telstar twice. Once was real good, and that was um, uh, the satellite, I believe it was the first satellite in space that was for communication and where you had to talk, talk through Hawaii, Okinawa, Hawaii, Texas, and then home. And after you got through making a statement, you had to say over because all the ham operators would have to throw the switch all together. And then... All the ham operators? Yeah, it was all different the individual the ham operators. It was a relay network. So they all would have to throw a switch. When you said over, they would throw a switch and then... You know, I was talking to my mother, my father, or Sheila, my wife. They could talk, and then they would say over, and then they throw the switch, and then you could talk. It was just like a, a regular two-way radio. So and they, got, they were good at it because people, you, know, you would get to say over, but they knew someone was going to say something, so they all throw the switch. So it was, that was pretty good. I mean, that was good until after you hang up, and then you realize they're home and you're still in Vietnam. Not a pleasant place to be, but... Um, I was, I mean, I was, I guess I was one of the few that could talk over, say they talked over Telstar. Really? Yeah, it I mean, it wasn't, I mean, thing. how many people have done it? Oh, no. It wasn't common at all. It was brand new for, um, I, I don't even remember how I was able to do it, but, oh, no, not a lot of guys could do it. Only, like, one or two a night, if they, if it was up, could do it. And that was it. You had a certain time, and you only could talk for, I think, ten minutes. I mean, it was a real short period. But it was pretty neat. I mean, actually, it wasn't bad communication. We tried it again a second time. For some reason, it just didn't work as good. Were all the soldiers given the same opportunity or no? Uh, I don't know. I, uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it's just being at the right type place at the right time. What was the food like? When I cooked, it was good. <laughs> um, it wasn't, I mean, if you're in the mess hall, if you're back in base camp, um, the mess hall wasn't bad. I mean, it was, it wasn't, it was, it wasn't bad food at all. I think they did a good job with what they could. The sea rats are sea rats. Um, when you're out, um, you ate them, and they weren't that bad. I mean, it's, it said World War II on it, so they weren't new stuff. Yes, it's um, World War II vintage, and um, I mean, you had the ham and MFs, and uh, everybody remembers those. And the ham was good, but you didn't eat the beans and. But generally, if uh, we all got together and we did have the time, we'd just mix them into a big bowl and everybody carried hot sauce and you covered everything with hot sauce. So I think most people would know that when Vietnam veterans came home, I think they always had a bottle of hot sauce with them when they sat down to eat. I mean, um, my family always looked at me weird from morning to night. There was always a bottle of hot sauce on the table. Is that still true? Oh yeah, I like my hot sauce.
I mean, I don't put it on everything now, but we covered, you know, the eggs or anything with it. And it gave us a good taste. But the sea rats aren't that bad, right? You, I mean, you get used to it. What was the living conditions like? I had it better than most. I had a hooch. Um, I had a bunk most of the time when we were in base camp, um, screened in. Um, we had a place to take a shower when we had water. And uh, I mean, it wasn't that bad. Um, when you were out, you're out and uh, you know, you lived off the land. But I had it met better than most. How big was the camp that you were in when you were in base camp? How big would you say that was? Oh, geez, how big? It was spread out because you had um, first recon battalion, you had a, a motor pool area. I mean, it was spread out down the road. Um, it was a um, first medvac. The medical unit was there. Medical recon. Us. I don't know. I mean, it. Uh, I guess it's numbers-wise. How many people? Yeah. I I uh, don't know. I mean, the actual headquarters had to be guessing a hundred people, at on the most. You know, in the uh, medical unit. I don't know. I mean, uh, I really never thought of the numbers on it. The recon unit. There couldn't have been more than. Um, a hundred people assigned to recon, not even, I don't think. They're always looking for, uh, they used to have a sign up free helicopter rides to join recon if you want to join recon. Did they get any takers? Oh yeah, yeah, they got takers. But um, uh, they're, they're a different breed of people. When they went down, we, we'd go out with them once in a while and for whatever reason, if they didn't have a gunner or they didn't have this or that, because they went out in eight man teams or they would go on a sweep. We'd had to go out at night or, you know, we're going on an operation. They would bring us out and um, I think it was the recon operation when we got nail going out, you know, when we went down the river, but, you know, we got ambushed right away. So, had the helicopters taken you out? Oh yeah, we went out by helicopters sometimes. Sometimes we just humped out. But the helicopters, if we could get up to the top of a mountain or something, we would go up, we'd fly up to the top of the mountain on a helicopter and then get out from there. The medical unit that was on your headquarters base, was it a field hospital or just an aid station? No, it was a, um, it was like a half mile down the road or I'm guessing, you know, but it's, um, it was a field hospital. In fact, uh, when I was there, um, there's an opening scene from the movie MASH and it, of uh, looking down the um, alley or the uh, hallway or whatever you want to call it with the beds on each side. And you see all the blood and all the stuff on the floor. And uh, when I was there, I could, you know, that's exactly every time I saw that movie Mash, it pops right back into your head. That's exactly what it was looking like. It was just doctors working. Did you have plenty of supplies and resources? Were there any shortages? No, I think we were okay. We um, we had the old flak vests where. Uh, uh, with the uh, lead in, uh, plates put in, the army and um, the army had the new stuff with the Kevlar. Uh, we had all the old stuff. The Third Marine Division actually got new some new stuff too. But um, other than that, I mean, it's, I mean, but sometimes you wore the flak vest, sometimes you didn't. Um, there was no rules on it. But uh, no, we did okay. I think the supplies were okay. Everything was uh, functional. What did you do for? to deal with stress and pressure from being in combat? Yeah, we played cards, uh, we drank. Uh, if you could get any type of booze or beer, that always uh, solved the problem. Um, but that was about it. A lot of card games and then we'd have, uh, uh, once every couple of months I think it was, they'd bring a show in, some type of a, a show, uh, some dancing girls or some music. If you were back in base camp, you got to see it. And we got to see Bob Hope at Christmas time. You did? Yeah, the big, uh, it was down in Da Nang. We were allowed to go down there. I think half of US us were allowed to go. Show. Yes, the big one. Neil Armstrong was there, and um, Connie Stevens was there. 
All and, at the same time? Oh yeah, Gold, gold Dust Twins. Gold so, Dust Girls, whatever they were from the Dean Martin show. The dancers were there. So yeah, that was, was a good Christmas show. Christmas of 70? That was Christmas of 69. February 70 I was home. Uh, so Christmas of 69 you got to see Bob Hope? Yes. Right in Da Nang? Yeah, it was uh, I mean, it wasn't, yeah, it was in Da Nang. It was in a big field in Da Nang. I don't know exactly where it was, but we were flown in there and we got to see Bob Hope. And there are some pictures from that show in, in Mike's uh, album. Mike, you were telling me earlier that there was a price on Bob Hope's head. That's what we were always told, that he was the most wanted person in Vietnam because he, uh, he was so dedicated to the uh, troops. And um, wherever he went, brought in everybody that could actually get to see him. And um, if you were able to see him, I'm not sure how many shows he did, but he was over there for a couple of weeks, and security was heavy. Um, I don't know if the televisions picked it up, but there was a lot of helicopters in the air and uh, a lot of ground forces just to protect him. But he was such a morale booster. He was the best of the best. Did it boost the morale for your unit as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was... Uh, I mean, he's done it for so many wars. I mean, he was the man. I, I don't think any veteran would never say no to him if he wanted anything. Did you do anything special for good luck? Yeah, I, uh, I have a necklace. Um, I got a St. Christopher's medal. It's, uh, my wife gave it to me uh, right before I went to Nam, December 25th, 1968, Christmas. I still got it. I still wear it. And it keeps me in uh, good standings with the right people. <laughs> what did you do for entertainment other than drinking and playing cards and an occasional U.S. And that was show? it. That was it? And that was about it. Um, I, uh, I mean, there was volleyball. We did play some volleyball. There was a volleyball net hooked up. We got to play that. But it wasn't like, um, I mean, it's not like it's an eight eight-hour job. I mean, it's a 24-hour duty. You did have break times, but when you had break times, there wasn't, um, well, there was a place called Freedom Hill that, um, it was a beer garden, I believe a movie theater, and they sold clothes and jewelry and um, stuff like that, and we're, if you could get down there, that wasn't too far away, that was Hill 327, and we'd try to hitch a ride there to get down there once in a while to, um, if you had an off day or something, you go there and watch a movie or get a suit made. I had a couple of suits made. Was it like a little town? A it village? was four or five. Yeah, it was four or five buildings, like quant not quanted huts, but like butler buildings, middle buildings, and they were stretched out. And the beer garden was just picnic tables, I believe, and uh, drank a lot of Falstaff beer. <laughs> was it run by Americans or was it from the Vietnamese people? The Vietnamese people worked there. Um, I think it's, geez, I don't know. Now that, that's an interesting question. But the Vietnamese people worked there, but I'm sure it was, was it sanctioned by the American men? government. Oh yeah, it was, I mean, we went there, but now that you say that, it was all the Vietnamese people working that um, measured you or waited on you or whatever. Mm, it wasn't too many, maybe, I think it was managed by, uh, it had to be managed by the service because it was a serviceman's relaxation place. So. Where did you travel while you were in the service? And that was it. That was it? And that was it. They always promised me or promised us we would hit Hawaii. And they were right. We hit Hawaii to refuel on the way over. And we were called off the plane, stood in formation for about 40 minutes, got back on a plane and left to Okinawa. That's how we did it. And that was what they promised. They didn't lie to you. So you hit Hawaii. Oh. Yeah, I went in the service, went to Okinawa, you know, went to Nam, came back from Nam, went to Okinawa, back to California, and came home. How was, far south did you get in Vietnam? China Beach. Danang. Oh, China Beach. Yeah, we went to China Beach for the day, but or for the weekend, I guess. But we were just north of Da Nang the whole time. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events? Well, you made your own, I guess. Uh, there are some stuff over there, but it's uh, more of a sick humor than anything. Uh, you are in a different mindset, but uh, no, we um, there was some. I mean, history-wise, I went to a place called Marble Mountain, 
and it's all caves and stuff and we went in there just to uh, do a patrol um, nothing major and it's all you'd be in a cave and all of a sudden you come on a, a, a temple with an altar with all different colors made out of stone um, and all carvings and um, one place had a beak it was a beak cavern and up on the side I'm guessing 30 40 feet up was a huge Buddha statue carved into the side of the wall and, um, and that was uh, very that was nice to see stuff like that was uh, you'd be walking in the um, in the mountains and all of a sudden you come across a, a Buddhist temple with the colors and the architecture you know it's all stone it's beautiful um, the problem is they're all beat up with shrapnel and stuff from you know guns and grenades and everything else but um, I just remember that, that with the uh, Buddhists that was really something to go into all of a sudden you're in a cave and you light it up and there's these statues it was beautiful you know, it was a beautiful country. Vietnam's a beautiful country. You know, so, but yeah, stuff like that would, you know, that that was the nice stuff to look at. Can you tell me what a typical day would be like? Typical day? When I was uh, in the mail room only or just... Uh, no, you, when you were both mail room or when you... Well, we could, we could be working in the mail room. And uh, we could, you know, get up maybe get breakfast maybe not it depends if you're that hungry or whatever but you would um, go to the mail room I would and uh, if we were getting called out that night they would tell you you know make sure you get all your gear and everything get geared up and they'll tell you you're either uh, gonna go out tonight or you knew you're gonna go out and you go out for three days five days it depend short we went out for short times or you could be up on the hill and that was called Provisionary Company, I think. And you would do um, line duty at night. And you would either be up on a line, the main line, or you're down on a listening post, an LP down a couple hundred yards in front of the line. And you're out there by yourself with three other guys. And your job is to be, you know, if you hear anything, or you you got to let them know quick and then you have to find your way back. Um, so that was, that was done that was half the time anyway I think that was I mean that was half the time if, if you're doing line duty oh yeah that was at least half the time you were doing line duty so, so you and then you worked at night and then you had to work during the day too I mean so if you didn't sleep at night you sort of got through the day and then I think like the next night we were off or next two nights we were off but it depended on the activity and how much movement was in the area and who needed help and stuff like that so it's like doing two separate jobs. You did a rear duty job. I mean, you're talking um, all the uh, G2 people, uh, well, the mess hall, uh, the MPs. Um, geez, who else? I mean, everybody. Everybody that was, you know, kept the company running. But then you had to go and do your duty at night. Or if you went out, you went out. Were your patrols always at night? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we never went out during the day. That I, I never went out during the day that I can recall. We would be out overnight, um, but I don't recall ever leaving during the daytime. Interesting. Yeah, I don't recall that, no. Late afternoon. And then when you would stay out for three or four days at a time, you'd just sleep out in the bush? Oh, yeah. Do you recall any of your officers? Sheridan? Sherman? I think his names were. What was he like? If, I, if that's his right name, I think he was a Mustanger. He was an enlisted um, troop. Uh, he was an enlisted Marine. Uh, he came up through the ranks. Um, and then he, uh, Mustanger is a guy that crosses over from uh, enlisted to officers. And I believe he uh, became an officer that way. Um, we had a top Sergeant Cooney, who, if anybody knows Red Fox, he's a perfect double of Red Fox, who everybody respected. He was a good man. Um, but uh, there was, I can't remember the officers, um, Hastings, there was a Lieutenant Hastings. What did you think of the officers? They were, they were okay, they did their job. They, um, they watched out for the men. They had their job to do and I, the ones we had watched out for us. They, uh, they did what they had to do, they had to make the tough calls. Now, when you left service, you were a Lance Corporal. When were you promoted from a, what did you start out as a PFC? Started out as 
start off as a private? When were you promoted from a private to a PFC? Uh, probably in North Carolina for my infantry training. I, I really don't remember. I was given Lance Corporal in Nam, and then I was up for Corporal and I just didn't make it. What did you think of your fellow soldiers? Good people. Um, everybody, uh, all the idealistic people in the, that were growing up at that time, um, poor. Um, I came from West Hartford, Connecticut, which was basically an all-white community. Um, and all of a sudden you're in the service and you're meeting everybody, every race, the culture, differences. And it's really, a, it's a great melting pot. It's great to learn about people. And uh, we did okay. We watched out for each other. But you found out everybody from the African-Americans from New York City to the Southerners to uh, Mexicans, you know, that you found out about everybody. It was great. It was a great learning experience. Did you form any close friendships? Yeah, we had a we we stayed tight with a few guys. Kept it small. Did you stay in touch with any of your fellow soldiers after you got home from Vietnam? The first year. We made some phone calls and we tried to get together down at uh, Washington D.C. a couple of times, but and then we just fades off. One of my questions is later um, is, did you attend any reunions? So I guess this would be... No. Have there been any reunions for your unit that you know? I don't, I don't know, probably. I don't know. I don't, uh, I don't keep track of the reunions. Did you keep a personal diary while you were in Vietnam? No. no but Michael has several photographs that will be submitted to the Library of Congress along with his tape. Do you recall your last day in Vietnam? Uh, sort of. Um, tradition is that uh, you get drunk the night before. And, and uh, we kept to our tradition, sure, Marine Corps tradition. Um, uh, we always celebrated uh, the last night before the wake up and uh, uh, getting on a plane and getting out of Da Nang. Da Nang Air Base was hit. Before we went on R&R, &R, Da Nang Air Base got shelled. And we didn't think we were going to make it on R&R, &R, but the pilots got the plane out with no problem. Over, I don't know how they do it, but they were able to do it. And the night before um, we were flying out, they took a little hit. And they just took some orders, but um, we got on that plane. And it's one thing you never forget is how quiet the plane was as it was taken off. It was quiet until they got us out over the sea. And then the pilot came on and told us, we're away, and then the whole place takes off. And then it was nothing but celebration. You know, everybody made it. Wow. Yeah, but it was so quiet. Everybody was walking on a plane, and I mean, we just want to get out of there. It was a full plane? Yes. Like, you had a picture that you showed me earlier with those letters on it. Some, 99 and wake up. Oh, a Figmo calendar. Figmo. Um, 100 days left. F-I-G-M-O. Um, uh, and it was, everybody had one of those when they were down to their 100th day. They had 100 days left in country. And it was 99 days in a wake up and it showed a genie uh, waking up a sleeping soldier. It was a cartoon. So what were your last 100 days like? Are you considered short time once you're down to 100? Yes. Yeah. You're short time, but you're really short time when you're down to 30 days. But 100 would be a, a short time or you got through two thirds of it a little more. Uh, we were lucky that um, we were there for thir everybody was there for 13 months, but they started withdrawing troops early. And when we got split up, when we first got there, the Third Marine Division was there for six months, and they got pulled out early. And instead of doing 13 months, we only had to do 12 months, and that was big, losing a month. That was huge. All of a sudden, you got 30 days knocked off your uh, tour. You didn't know that until the end, or did you know that going in? We didn't know that until. Uh, I think we had like two months left or three months left. It was in, we were into the Figmo calendar and we went, wow. Yeah. Yeah, we can actually uh, take a lot of time off at that time. What was and that was, a big, that was a big thing for us. When you left um, Vietnam, what was the date? February 8th, 1970. 
Did you fly directly home? No, we flew into uh, Texas for refueling, then we went into um, El Toro. We went to Okinawa, I'm sorry, we went to Okinawa first. We were in Okinawa for a few days for, um, I think they call it rehabilitation. Try to bring us back to normal life or something and they basically try, try to assign you to a work details like mowing a lawn or working in a mess hall or picking up garbage and um, some guy, I mean it, after a few days they, um, I mean guys knew they were leaving the service, they were already we already knew that we could get out of service, so there wasn't much motivation in our part to listen. I remember that. Um, but we were only there like three days, and then um, we were sent to California for two days, and we were home with, I think we were home within a week, maybe a week and a half at best, from Nam to home. Really? Mm -hmm. now, I, got, I was home February 13th. When you came home back to the United States, um, did you come as a unit or individually? You, well, you come as a, you come as a unit, not as a, our unit. I mean, your unit's made up of all different people from different times, so you're an individual. But you came back with you know full plane. And when you landed in California, where did you go from there? We were in El Toro for a couple of days, and then we just booked our flights home. Individually, so they yes. just got on your flight. Well, they own help flight. you. They help you. They they yeah. You just got on your own flight and you left. What you did just that left feel the base. Like? Well, it was great. <laughs> that was uh that was a good flight um a lot of you're still in uniform you had to fly in uniform and uh, there was a lot of respect wherever we land i remember landing in chicago and uh, a lot of respect for uh, the uniform which was nice you know you see all the bad stuff but guys you, you know no people would talk to you know people would come up to you and you know you're on your way home whatever buy you a drink and that was pretty good you know because you feel? figure you're only 19 years old, you're in Nam and 20, not even 21, and people can buy you drinks when you're in uniform. So. How did it feel being back in the world after being out in the boonies of Vietnam for a year? It must have felt a little strange. Yeah, it was strange. I mean, you adapt differently. Um, I think everybody's 4th of July is a little different with the explosions and stuff. You know, it brings back memories instantly. Um, but you adapt. You um, buy yourself a car right away. 1970 Barracuda and you learn how to drive again on roads and you learn how to behave yourself when people blow their horns at you or they bump into you or whatever I mean you just you learn how to behave quickly and you just can't be uh, you're not in a, you're not in a different world you are in the real world it was good everybody was good everybody was patient you drink a little too much you smoke a little too much cigarettes um, and that was another thing. We went and went into service not smoking, and then you start smoking two or three packs a day. If you're a smoker, you know, you just it's something to do, I guess. What did you do in the days and the weeks right after you got home? Mm, now, were you still slept. actually in the service, or were you discharged once you got home? Oh, uh, you're you're discharged. I was discharged, but you know, you, know, you have a six-year obligation. But there was a group of us. And um, they told us that um, you're discharged, but within six months, if we needed you for something, I forgot what it was. It was sort of a, but we were out. I was basically out at that time, and um, it so was an you early could go discharge. Back to civilian life. Yes, they, yes, I could. They told us not to really worry about it, so I didn't do too much. I um, met a lot of old friends and family, and we ate a lot and slept a lot. Made up a lot of, caught up on a lot of sleep. And uh, got a job right away and tried to go back to school. That didn't work. And um, everything worked out pretty good for me. What did you get a job doing when you got out? I first went back to uh, A&P that uh, started working there for a little while. Then I, um, the veterans program for Vietnam veterans, uh, MDC is the Water Bureau in the Hartford County. They um, had a veterans um, hiring program, so all the um, veterans took tests, uh, Vietnam veterans took tests for the job. They had 12 job openings, and um, I was fortunate. I got one of the 12 jobs, and I was there, and at the same time, I took a job. I took the test for West Hartford Fire Department, and I was fortunate to get on West Hartford Fire Department within uh, 
a uh, couple year, a year and a half, really. So you were actually eligible for the MDC job and the West Hartford Fire Department? Yeah, I took the MDC job because I had to wait for the fire department. I was at MDC for like eight, nine months. And it was a good program because it was a training program. They paid you so much money as, a tr as learning a new job. So much for going to school. We had to go to school. What was the job? Yeah, it was sewage treatment plant operator. So you actually got some training? I got the training and uh, well, he did the work. He worked during the day, went to school at night. Um, it was a good job. They paid as well and, uh, and I was always thankful for that, that we were able to, that they hired the uh, Vietnam veterans. And from there you went to the West Hartford no, Fire, Department. Fire Department? Yes. Did you continue in your education? Uh, yes. All of a sudden I had a new uh, new feeling and a new understanding for what, ed what education can bring to you. And I went to school nights and uh, it took me 14 years and I got my bachelor's degree. Did you uh, use the GI Bill? Yes. I used it for both work and education. A gentleman at the Hartford office, uh, Rock Over Nile, took care of uh, Vietnam veterans. He was uh, very patient. He walked us through all the processes. He was excellent. Do you stay in touch now with any Vietnam vets? Uh, Vietnam vets, yes. Down at the uh, VFW I belong to. But not the ones I've served with. Did you join any veterans organizations? Just um, um, the VFW. And that's the West Hartford the, that's, yeah, Post? That's 9929 Post. And a um, disability, um, I forgot the name of it. Disabled. Veterans, yeah, disabled veterans. You're a member of that? Yes. When did you join the VFW? Right away when you got out or not? Until yes, later? immediately when I got out. My father was a member and all his friends and we sort of grew up there too at the parties, the Christmas parties and everything. And uh, yes, yeah, right after I got out, within six months. And that's located in West Hartford, Connecticut? Yes. How did the older veterans accept the uh, Vietnam vets? Good. They, uh, they, uh, the World War II veterans were always the uh, heroes. They were always, everybody looked up to them. The Korean vets were sort of, uh, people didn't even recognize Korea vets. And um, and I don't know if they still recognize them today. And uh, the Vietnam vets were, you know, you, you did a good job, but, you know, it's one of those butt things all the time. Um, but, uh, yeah, we always got along. There was never, I've never seen any trouble in a VFW. They're all, uh, everybody has the same core of values, I think, when you go into a VFW. You could be rich, you could be poor, black, white anything and everybody gets along. Everybody uh, understands each other. What activities are you involved in with either the VFW or the disabled veterans? No, I'm just a member and I support them. My time schedule doesn't allow me to uh, fully commit myself. Not until you retire. When I retire then I will, yes. Now you went to work for the West Hartford Fire Department. How many years did you stay there? Just over 24 years. And I understand you were the fire chief? The last eight years I was the fire chief, yes. And what did you do after that for a career? I retired on a Friday and Monday I went to work for the Hartford Fire Department as an assistant fire chief. I've been there seven and a half years. And you're working there now? Yes. Does any of your experience in the military help you with your duties as fire chief? Yeah, I think so. It's quasi-military, the fire departments. Um, you have to follow orders on our job like you do in the military. But I think the most important thing is you learn how to handle people. Um, I would say men because when I joined the fire service it was only men but now it's uh, women and men but um, you learn how to handle people of all nationalities and races and um, it's a good experience there's a lot of veterans in the fire service
Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about military in general? Say that again? Did, my Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Now? Yes. Oh yeah, I look at the war going on now. I think about it. I think how hard it is. Uh, you got the families over there and now they just found out they have to stay another three months. Um, quite a group. And I was one of the guys that had my um, time shortened by a month and how thrilled we were. But to think that you're coming home on a certain date and everybody knows the date that you are leaving the combat zone, all of a sudden it's extended three months. I think that's pretty harsh. Um, I think a lot of this war today is the reservists are over the, doing a, a lot of the fighting. And I have, and I know a lot of reservists sort of complain that, you know, they're being sent over, but that's their job. I didn't feel sorry for them. I do feel sorry when they are sent, they do come back. And they're going back again, and I know some veterans that are going back again, and I don't think that's that's got to be. I don't. Even, I can't even picture being like that. You have a family. You go over and do your duty. You come back. You're home for six months, and now they're going back over again. I mean, that's horrible on the family. I um, I have trouble with that end of the service, and uh, I've always had trouble with the way we pulled out of Vietnam. The way we just packed up and left. 58,000 service people died. For what? You have to think about that. We weren't allowed to do a lot of things. But over 58,000 service people, around, the names are on the wall. And they are names, they're not numbers. And the Vietnam War was considered a numbers war. How many killed today? How many injured today? You know, how many missing in action? Well, they're not numbers. They're names. How did your service and experiences in Vietnam affect your life? Uh, makes me appreciate everything we have. Been married 32 years. And got a good family, came from a good family. Um, family's everything, friends. You learn that uh, we're in a pretty good shape in this country. Um, people don't know the, the real world. You know, we're spoiled in this country. After 9-1-1, I think they had a little bit of an experience of what, how war can come to the home front. Um, as bad as Vietnam was, um, I was in New York City on 9-1-1 with the Hartford Firefighters. I brought two dozen Hartford Firefighters up to assist the New York Fire Department. That was devastating. That was horrible to see. But people don't understand. They could see it on television, but I don't think it really affected people in the Midwest and out west as much as it affected in the Northeast. And um, that's how it is, that's how we are. We're spoiled, we're, uh, we encapsulate ourselves in our own regions. Oklahoma City got hit, and out there it was traumatic. You know, on the East Coast it was traumatic for a few days and everybody went about their business. So I think we're spoiled here, and um, I appreciate everything we have. And we live it every day. It's a great life. Do you think that your background in the military helped you when you went down to New York for 911? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, it did because it was just devastating. It was. Because uh, it was probably more like a war zone. Oh, it was. It was something that was just unbelievable. Um, the whole trip in the military that was uh, in circle uh, that circled the whole that set up the perimeter, uh, the buildings that were protected, working with the military, working with the police department. Um, it was. Uh, I mean, yeah, and being on the fire service, I mean, you you get hard into the bad stuff, I guess, and you just do your job. But um, yeah, the service always um, it will always have an effect on uh, on me or on any veteran. Now you were in the Marine Corps, and I know the Marines consider themselves an elite and special group. What's your impression or opinion of the Marine Corps? They're the best. <laughs> They're. Uh, they are trained, um, but to be honest with you, in a combat situation, Army, Navy, Marine, Air Force, Coast Guard today, everybody, when you're under fire or you're under attack or you have to do something, um, it all comes down to your, what's inside the individual. And I think everybody's prepared, but everybody knows the Marines are the best. Still, huh? Now you talked about the reservists that are going to the Iraq War right now. In Vietnam, um, what was the role of the reservists then? Some reservists were called up. Um, 
I believe they tried to put a whole reserve company into action. I don't have the exact dates and the reservist company numbers, but I heard they took a lot of casualties and um, their great plan of thinking that you can just do some training and put a whole group of people into a combat zone doesn't work. You learn a little bit from training, but it's just experience in a, in a war zone. You just learn day to day. Um, I didn't have it as bad as a lot of people. And a lot of people out there got a lot more experience than I had. But what I saw, you learn day to day and you listen. But um, the reserves that are called up, that's why they're extended now. They're saying that um, they have the experience. Well, that's good, but it's hard on the families, like I said. And um, it's sort of an experience you don't want. Did you actually work with any reservists in Vietnam? No. No. Have you visited the Vietnam Wall? Uh, many times. What was your feeling when they put that up? Mixed. Um, I think it was needed. Um, I, was, I liked the way it was designed with the names. At first I couldn't figure it out, you know, wonder why they were putting it in the ground. There's a lot that goes into it now. Um, but the whole area down there with the Vietnam Wall, um, we were just down there a couple of years ago to see the Korean uh, monument, which is very impressive. Um, I believe there's 16 servicemen coming across a rice paddy, and in the reflection is the other 16, so you got the 38th parallel, I believe, is uh, how that came about. Yeah, there's recognition to the um, to the Navy, to the females, the Navy uh, nurses, Navy nurses, the the nurses that served in Vietnam, they were never given recognition. So there's a nice, well, that's a, there's a monument down there to, take, to um, give them recognition. And you got the three servicemen from the Vietnam, but the wall is uh, very important. It's very important to see the actual names. Is there anything else that you would like to add that we have not covered in this interview? No, I was proud to serve. Uh, I think everybody uh, I know, we're all proud to serve, and um, it's a shame that we do have VFWs and American Legions, and we do have to fight wars. But it's it's history, and it's in the future, apparently. Um, but uh, I wish the best to all the uh, servicemen that are fighting right now, and all the future servicemen and their families. I hope they come back uh, healthy and physically and mentally. Well, Mike, I'd like to thank you for your time. I'd like to thank you for your service.